the title of my presentation uh, is Consequence of Practice, and it's really um, the past few years I haven't done too many talks primarily because I'm not sure if I have any answers that I can share. Uh, and the reason why I've kind of uh, called this lecture uh, Consequence of Practice is also the fact that what's tended to happen is that one thinks that over, over time with experience you, you find answers, right, to questions that you don't, that you don't seem to, to kind of be able to answer in your earlier years. But what, I, what I've found is that as time has kind of gone on, I've, the, the number of questions has only kind of multiplied and I'm still searching for answers. So what I'm going to do today is, um, is just talk about these few questions that that we kind of uh, deal with. And uh, while I do that, I'm going to do that uh, uh, reverse chronologically, right? So I'm going to go from the newest projects to, uh, to the older ones. The first question is, uh, how do you do more with less? And this really comes from this kind of need of our time where we actually are uh, using resources that are extremely scarce. Anything that we do is energy intensive. So the question that we're dealing with is how can we fulfill all the kind of needs of a program and of a kind of space and yet uh, try and kind of uh, use a minimum amount of uh, material. Uh, in this small project that we've done in, uh, in rural Maharashtra, it's a kind of granary shed. It's a set of four granary sheds that we've converted uh, and this is the first phase that we finished one, uh, where that granary shed is now being converted into a, a lab. It's a kind of lab that uh, looks at chemical pro uh, properties of materials and kind of looks at uh, how they can be applied in uh, biosciences. Uh, what we've actually done in this project is, is very simple. It's a shed that kind of, uh, it's, it's built out of stone and brick walls and it's got a roof that's uh, a metal roof. Uh, we've actually inserted a building within this, at least that's what we are saying, but uh, counterintuitively the building form uh, defines the courtyard and not the actual program itself. Um, and what you see is we've also kind of added uh, various skylights to bring in natural light. So what uh, this effectively means is we are actually uh, trying to create uh, space with light, trying to define uh, the, uh, the experience through very small interventions that suture uh, the fabric. What you actually see here are windows that we added to the, the, the shed which was very, very dark. Uh, the one of the uh, the sheds that was derelict has now a small canopy that kind of signifies where the entry to the project is, and you kind of enter into this uh, this kind of space that was in, was a ruin for for most uh, for most of the time that we saw it. But then we were able to kind of create this uh, sense of shade, and then you can that leads you into uh, the actual space uh, which has. Uh, this courtyard around which the programs are structured, and this is inside the shed. Um, what you see here is uh, the original columns of the space and the way that we've tried to kind of keep the beams the way that they were, and um, really just looked at uh, ways for the light to actually create a sense of uh, space. So the material uh, logic here is just uh, limited to, to the intervention of that uh, building within a building, and it's actually a material that is used by the lab, that's specified by the lab for it to uh, for, for their kind of antiseptic properties. Um, you can see each of these programs is uh, skylit, so there is a kind of reasonable amount of light coming in during the day. And um, what, what this kind of ties back into is uh, how much do we need to actually create a program, yes, but also to uh, maybe kind of create an emotive uh, uh, experience within the space. The second question that, that I've often, uh, and I still kind of uh, grapple with, and I'm sure a lot of us here uh, do, is, is this, you know, uh, the, the idea of uh, the Indian way, right? What, what defines uh, our uh, culture? Is it, is it such an entity that can be defined as a monolith? This, of course, comes from a title of a very famous uh, essay by A.K. Ramanujan uh, called Is There an Indian Way of Thinking, which I highly recommend uh, anyone interested in kind of culture uh, read. Um, and uh, to kind of maybe talk about this a little bit, I'm showing a project that we've finished. Uh, it's a kind of a hostel project in Kota in Rajasthan, where the typical fabric that you actually uh, look at historically is this beautiful uh, haveli with the jarokhas, courtyards, and you can actually clearly see uh, in these diagrams uh, uh, from uh, from the, how the house kind of converts from a little rural agglomeration to the left top down to a kind of urban uh, haveli with a courtyard. And of course, the kind of roofscape, the terraces that you actually get, the kind of sense of uh, the sectional city uh, in some sense that gets, that gets made. And yet, what current development is, is this. This is the kind of fabric that you actually see in uh, tier two, tier three towns. 
So when we were actually asked to design this uh, hostel, what we were trying to also imagine in our heads is a means to create an architecture that is, of course, uh, layered, as in various programs along the plan as you go up, but also the fact that the section becomes a way to organize this, uh, the building both internally as well as with its kind of relation to the street and the city. The program actually is for uh, for hostel rooms, for uh, for people, for for kids who come here to study uh, for the entrance exam to IIT. As you might already know, Kota is a big hub for that to happen. And you've got uh, kids coming from all over the country. There are about two lakh uh, people who kind of, kids who come to this, uh, to Kota to kind of study for their entrance exams. The default type of the hostels is extremely uh, oppressive where there are rooms on both sides of a single loaded, of a double loaded corridor with no space. There are also very high number of suicides that happen when kids don't make it, uh, you know, through the exam. Um, so what we were trying to do is trying to see if we can create a space that still allows for engagement between uh, the, the children who kind of study here. And the section here actually kind of tries to depict the fact that there, it's a kind of continuously changing uh, sectional uh, space where there are terraces, where there is a courtyard in the middle that allows for cross ventilation, where the, roo, the, where the plan type actually uh, works with the courtyard, but also kind of keeps changing as you keep going higher to a point where it kind of manifests as a series of uh, voids that actually are cut out within the solid mass of what the program needed to be uh, to create these kind of terraces at, at various levels. That's what we were also kind of seeing. I mean, it was very interesting when these two ladies started conversing across the multiple floors, the fact that that sectional city becomes extremely important for us to also understand the way that uh, the urban condition in India, anywhere else, uh, anywhere in India rather, is not just a kind of top-down format. It's also something that needs to be looked at in terms of layers, almost like a kind of palimpsest that kind of defines both program as well as activity. Yeah, this is this is this is something that also kind of captures that very beautifully. Uh, the uh, the rooms itself are kind of structured in a way so you get natural light coming in where you study. So it's it's really something that uh, hopefully creates a much more kind of uh, let's say uh, an environment that is supportive for, for for students who are kind of studying here. And that's the kind of building within the fabric that it sits in. And what we've tried to do is also with that void that you see at the bottom connect the street to the the, the ground behind. So when you actually walk down that entire street, it's not not impervious anymore. There's a sense of a, uh, transparency that comes in because of the way that the form is uh, structured. The third question is um, really about how do we mark the ground that we that we build on. Uh, this is a small project that we uh, built in Cyan. It was supposed to be a temporary pavilion for a cafeteria building. Uh, we've designed a small little engineering building right next to it from which this cafe was supposed to be connected. Um, and uh, like I said, it was supposed to be temporary. So we designed the entire structure to be a series of columns and beams that are uh, dismantleable. So when the project needs to be taken off, it, it you can completely uh, remove the, uh, the pavilion without impacting the ground much. What you see here is really uh, the entire uh, project in a sense, where the project's essence is, is manifested by this one detail of the column that supports the seat, that supports the, the beam, that supports the roof, that supports, that supports the translucent underside of the, of the roof. Uh, that's really what we were kind of working with. Uh, you can see how it actually kind of uh, sutures itself between these various trees that already exist on site and uh, the way that entire pavilion floats above ground. The entire ceiling is actually translucent so that you get the kind of foliage of the uh, plants, the trees creating shadows on, uh, on the roof when you sit under. Uh, the, and this is, I think, this, 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 this notion of craft is something a lot of people have already spoken about, and uh, we can see that it's, it's a thematic that's, that's very uh, present in, in the exhibitions that we've seen here, but also something that is, uh, has been discussed for a long time. And uh, our typical uh, understanding of craft is also something that works with the image of what craft should be in memory. And uh, if, you, if you read, uh, let's say, Richard Sennett's views on it, he actually talks about craft being of its time. Uh, and that's something that we really kind of um, taken to heart in when we were kind of looking at this project that we've done in Hyderabad. It's a small residential building which, uh, which has two apartments per floor. Uh, and the developer came to us once he had already got the floor plan passed. So there's very limited uh, work that you can do. So we kind of tweaked the, uh, the floor plan to allow for cross ventilation, yes. Uh, but then we were kind of stuck with working with the, the envelope of the project. And we were wondering as to how do you create an architecture that uh, in some sense can also be performative, where the, where the building skin is no longer something that's just meant to, uh, to shield the inside from the outside, but it's something that also works as, uh, let's say, a support for the chajja, which is made out of stone, uh, the, the, sun, uh, the sun protector. 
And uh, within that entire construct, there's a bay window that actually suspends itself within uh, this undulation in the wall. Um, of course, I mean, we have a lot, the, the presenters before me have talk, talked about technology and how uh, you, know, you can use various software scripts to do this kind of um, scripting calculation. And of course, we did all of that. But, and this is a kind of detail of that uh, bay window sitting in the, uh, the undulating wall. But um, for me, the key to the project was not the scripting, not the, uh, the, the ability for us to draw that out, but the ability for us to construct. What you see here are tools that we made so that corbelling could be done exactly based on the, the, the script that we had actually evolved. So what you see within that corbel, at the, within that kind of template at the bottom, is the lower brick and its orientation, and what you see on top is how the next brick must sit. And these are visuals of what uh, the construction process led to, and that's the final project. You can see how the brick corbelling actually supports the, the stone chajja, and uh, yeah, these are some images of the bay window sitting within that kind of envelope of the undulating brick wall and the, uh, the stone uh, lintel. So as this project obviously is about the kind of exuberance of that wall and its ability to do more than one thing, but uh, it's as much about the ability for us to, to make low-tech tools that will allow for this kind of thinking where you're not just uh, creating an object, but you're also being able to effect change within the nature of the craft itself, where, where, the, where the mason, when he goes to the next project, is taking something with him that he ha is now imbibing and being able to now reproduce or push even further. So craft being off its time, uh, I, for us is extreme has it been extremely important and um, the next question then we kind of ask ourselves is development sustainable and this is again a question that I mean you know if you think about it everything that you build today has an impact on the environment however environment friendly it might be whatever however carbon neutral it might be is there a way for us to be and of course the costs that one uh, one kind of encounters to kind of to get to a carbon neutral building is are, are fantastic and uh, within our kind of structure uh, sometimes when small projects what w you think about what could be the potential for you to think about uh, environment and and uh, in this little small project where we did a factory building on a corner side in Bhavandi outside of Mumbai, um, we actually uh, looked at the site and found that on our site there was a, uh, at one corner, there was a water body that was a water harvest, well it's not a harvesting uh, pond, but it was actually an overflow pond for all of the area around. Whenever there was a monsoon uh, and water would fill up, that corner on our site would actually accommodate that, that runoff. Uh, so we decided to keep that uh, seasonal water body and build our entire building around it. That water body then became, was kind of structured into a kund of sorts where people could then sit around and the rest of the kind of factory building sat around it. Uh, on the first floor that entire building actually cantilevers above so you can see how the uh, the entire uh, building kind of floats above that water body here and these are images of the uh, building and the corner that's completely open to the precinct to allow for transparency but at the same time to kind of retain uh, that water body that uh, there's a bridge over that you can drive into the project through and that's it in the monsoons. And this is actually a kind of, uh, this is a big question as well, you know, what is your politics? I mean, this is something that um, all of us will have to answer at some point. And uh, is the idea of politics separated from uh, the idea of architecture? Can it be? given the fact that everything that we build uh, can be appropriated uh, in a way that might not be in tandem with what our uh, imagination of what that project is. And um, this, I have to enumerate this, uh, I'm gonna show this project called the Temple of Steps that we've done in, uh, in uh, again, rural uh, Andhra Pradesh. It's, uh, uh, it's a part of a kind of outreach project that we've done uh, with the JSW. And uh, this is a drawing that talks about how uh, we built a temple that was supposed to be uh, uh, for the local villagers uh, because they were kind of very keen to have a temple which they didn't have and it's based on the Balaji temple so the planning principles are pretty similar. I won't get into that in too much detail but the idea of the fact, uh, the idea of the temple was really coming from uh, the, the idea of water uh, and I'll come to why, the, why, why water was such an important thing and the fact that there is a relationship between water and land in the way that typical uh, traditional architecture is uh, negotiated that either through the idea of the kund or through the ghat. 
And um, that was really the kind of start point for our project because when we'd actually gone to site, what we found on site was during the quarrying process uh, for limestone in that area, uh, JSW was using water obviously to kind of cut the limestone and there was a lot of water that was wasted. So we were trying to look at how we could use all of that water, bring it back onto our site into a low-lying area there and to be able to then, uh, one, recharge groundwater and the second, to let the overflow go back into the farm so that the farmers could actually start uh, using that for irrigation as well. Um, these are just some drawings of the project and there's a main shrine, there's a smaller shrine and then there's a little priest's quarter and a kitchen and uh, kind of structured around the entire uh, si site is that low-lying area which we then had a kind of water body, uh, uh, water harvesting tank also kind of built in. All the plants around it phytoremediate the water so that it's a little bit uh, better, purer when it kind of goes back into the ground and that, these are the images of the temple. Um, the idea was to, to look at how that temple, of course, like I said, that while it's a religious project, Project. It's also for us a kind of social project, so we are being able to take that idea of water and then kind of transform the temple into a water project as well. Um, and it was also about how we could take that smallest module of the step and use that to actually transform into uh, the shikhara of the building. These are just some images of the temple. Um, and it's interesting that uh, while the temple, uh, I mean, it was, it was fairly uh, well kind of published, um, the, I got a couple of messages on on Twitter and uh, on on Instagram about how a kind of architect studied abroad uh, is now kind of uh, you know part of the Hindutva project, kind of building temples, you know, temple builder. And uh, I was a, I was a little shaken up until I saw the my feed the next day where I had uh, another group of people talk about how this is not uh, actual temple architecture, how this is actually uh, someone trying to defame uh, Hindu temple architecture so so it's it was it was it was interesting to see such contrary kind of impressions coming uh, for the same project and um, while one is uh, kind of ov obviously building a temple here what is really interesting for us or uh, what we've tried to do in this project is try to see if we can add another layer of program that is not necessarily aligned to the idea of religiosity but it's also working as a kind of social uh, product and that's uh, where we hope the project will be kind of looked at for its true uh, value rather than its perceived um, image as as uh, either of those two uh, categories. Um, the third, I mean, this this particular category, this particular question is really about uh, what, uh, how do you design, right? I mean, who is the designer? What what do we do as a profession? And uh, I think, and I'm, I'm very happy to see Aya sitting here, even though he's on his phone. But uh, this is really about some uh, the 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 idea of. Uh, what is the role of the professional? And to kind of look at this, what I'm going to talk also about is the models of practice that we've been working with. And India, as you know, of course, is this kind of, uh, this is the cliche is completely true, right? It's such a diverse country. And how does an architect know what to do in every single uh, project? Of course, there are tremendously variated geographies that we are working across. But there's also this kind of burning question of what happens in our cities, right? And this is what we actually uh, are challenged with as well. And whether as architects, we have any kind of mandate to deal deal with this. I mean, this is, uh, we don't obviously today, but um, they, it wasn't like this always, but at Independence, the architect was as much a part of the nation building frenzy as the politician or the bureaucrat was, right? So, but over time, uh, through the emergency, uh, through uh, the economic reforms, which was a kind of good thing, um, our, our mandate was eroded because we weren't being able to provide answers for questions that uh, either obliteration of, of civil liberties uh, happened or uh, during the time there were capital moved in so quickly that uh, as service providers we did just that, provide service and, and didn't really think about what we were building. And it's now that uh, we are now starting to see these uh, multiple models of practice that seem to emerge uh, that are talking about the nature of practice differently. Uh, some of these, of course, the, the IAS is here, so Bandra Collective fe uh, features in this, which I'm going to also talk about as we go on, but there's also Architecture Red who are here and many, many other practices who work in different formats to be able to now provide some sort of, Riaz I can see at the back as well, so Riaz is here too, uh, where we've kind of, uh, where he, he's been looking at this idea of uh, collective memory in the way that his work on step wells, so on and so forth. 
um, to a point where we uh, in, in Bandra got together to form uh, what we call the Bandra Collective, a group of six architects working pro bono for public space projects, uh, saying that, telling the uh, municipality that, you know, if there is something that you, you want to build in the public realm, please run that by us. We are most happy to kind of work with you on it, um, for free, that is. And uh, uh, our roles have not just been that. We've also been kind of working with advocacy, the Coastal Road Project. At a time when the Coastal Road was first announced, there were no images of what that Coastal Road was going to be. Uh, what we were doing merely was then kind of providing these kind of visuals of how the coastal road would change the interface between the city and its relationship with water. So all we were doing was providing maybe in, you know, at the face of it, not taking an active position on it, but we were providing enough data for people to start kind of thinking about it more seriously. Uh, the second aspect was this idea of kind of free active urbanism, and this is some work that we, uh, the, we as the Bandra Collective have been doing uh, within Mumbai when the lockdown was opening uh, two years ago. Uh, we actually worked with the local cooperator to design a series of installations that would actually uh, look at uh, creating safe distancing and safety measures for public space, including circle markings, distance parameters. Uh, some of this was also kind of done in, in parts of Mumbai with a cooperator who was very kind of accommodating, and and this this aspect of kind of looking for projects uh, or creating projects uh, as we feel uh, are needed and then trying to take them to, uh, to, uh, to uh, the councillors or to the resident groups is something that you know, we've been also kind of working on. Uh, so this is another alternative uh, to a kind of model of practice. The third is uh, through competitions, of course, this is a streets competition that we as the Bandra Collective won, where in the, in the heart of the city, we actually had this, uh, the road that was kind of put up for reimagining and we were able to redesign the entire road width to create an entire planter uh, green uh, greenway in the middle of the road uh, that's about 1.8 kilometers so you can go from your uh, from your metro stop to pavai walking about 1.8 kilometers on, uh, in, in a kind of uh, green park so we've literally been able to create a 1.8 meter park in the middle of the road so these are some mock-ups of um, uh, of what that parkway would be and uh, one of the other projects, one of the reasonably successful projects, has been uh, the ability to work with local resident groups to talk about programming of public space. This is the Carter Road Promenade in Bandra, where we worked to look at various kinds of programming. Uh, you know, even th simple things like uh, like tiling patterns, uh, public uh, gardens for for the elderly, and for for exercise areas for kids. Um, and to see how even a, a program that's very counterintuitive, which a lot of resident groups kind of protested against, uh, which was the kind of skate park, but today an extremely active space. Uh, kids come all the way from Dharavi and New Bombay to skate here. Uh, so we were able to kind of look at programming as a, as a, as a group to be able to, to kind of look at transformation. So I, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is uh, the models of practice that we need to, uh, to, uh, to engage with uh, the kind of context that we work in India also need to, uh, to be rethought. Um, talking about um, uh, this, this project, the Maya Somaya Library, we've been also thinking about what happens when we work beyond the urban. What happens when we work in areas where we don't have access to the kind of construction material technique or at least on the face of it that uh, that you would have in an urban area uh, for the library for this little library that we've done we actually were trying to build a, a landscape uh, which would become the library so that kids feel more compelled to engage with it uh, so really a kind of landscape of brick but to build this uh, in rural Maharashtra we were actually looking at a construction technique from 16th century Spain we were looking at construction details from uh, uh, 1960s the work of the engineer Eladio de Este in Uruguay we were using Using a software uh, from uh, Philippe Bloch's uh, uh, lab in ETH called Rhino Volt uh, to kind of ca calculate the compression of the structure and using material from Maharashtra to build in Maharashtra. So what we were arguing for in some sense is the even though you might be beyond uh, a kind of urban uh, condition, you're never kind of disconnected from uh, urban networks and the fact that we sit on such knowledge networks also allows us to look at the regional through a lens that is not necessarily limited to the idea of the regional in memory. It is also something that we can kind of imagine in a completely new way. Uh, and this was a project that, uh, that we did. It's a part of a larger school. It's a little library pavilion open on all sides, so you get very nice light and ventilation. Uh, like I said, it's built out of three layers of brick tile. 
Uh, these are the first mockups that went up, and you can see they were fairly successful. The trickiest part, of course, in this is to actually build uh, a curved structure and to look at costing of doing formwork for that. Uh, here, we actually used a reinforcement bar as formwork. So once the first layer of tiles was set, the reinforce bar, uh, reinforcement bar network was removed and used to construct a slab in another project. So there was zero cost to the formwork, and uh, that's the, the kind of underside of the project. You can see it's 150 feet long, it's 25 feet at its wide and it's only four and a half inches thick. There is no RCC, it's completely in compression. And it, of course, is a landscape that, uh, that people can walk on. And that's the interior space. What's really interesting about the interior space is the fact that, uh, again, it's, as you know, you're kind of working with extremely frugal means. You, you don't have the kind of budgets that you would have to kind of build otherwise. Uh, something that Arthur was also saying earlier. And here, what we were trying to do was when we were working with the glazing, because curved glazing would obviously be much more expensive and keeping a, th uh, you know, just kind of straight glazing would be, uh, would mean very thick sections. We actually styrated the glazing to create more kind of uh, strength in that and also be able to reduce the size the sections as we went along. Uh, the mesh, so the upper bit of the glazing actually has steel mesh to allow for cross ventilation and, the, and, and there is glass at the bottom. Um, just some more images of the project. There are different scales of spaces for different, uh, different places for kids to study. Um, as you can see, uh, the entire kind of project is something that um, uh, uh, that works across geographies, but also across time, and that was really what we were kind of, uh, that was the argument that we were making. This, uh, this, this, this thing, this idea of doubt is extremely important in our work and not in this uh, countdown towards, uh, you know, the first project. What I'm going to try to talk about is really how in this little project that we were building uh, next to a factory, uh, we were actually building within a grove of trees. It was a community center. We actually were trying to build the project in a way that would not impact a single tree. So our first impression was to try and see if we can work with the idea of the Buddhist uh, Chaitya, the Vihara, and to see if we can create uh, these little walls uh, in, in masonry that actually sit around the tree and don't, uh, so that's really the kind of reference that we were working on. Uh, these were the first drawings of project and you can see how uh, it progressed and we kind of, uh, the client was very happy, we were all excited, we were, we were going to start building this. We actually uh, went to a point where uh, we did initial markings on site as well. Uh, and uh, then suddenly we realized that while we responded in form to the trees, the trees no longer were an integral part of our experience when we were in the structure. Uh, and uh, we found a clue in a courtyard of a building that we sat in lunch for, which they had covered, and we were able to see a sliver in the, in the difference between the two roofs where you could actually see the greenery outside. And uh, that led us to this idea that we could flip the roof so that when you're inside, you could actually still look at the foliage on the outside. This is the plan of the project. It's really a very simple plan. It's got uh, a kind of uh, a vocational training space. It's got a uh, meditation hall. It's got three dormitories and an admin block. Uh, we worked extens extensively with the local community, we ran the plans by them. We brought Hunarshala on to work with us on uh, using uh, rammed earth. And then we found that the earth that, uh, that we were going to use was uh, was uh, didn't have enough clay content and it would needed too much uh, cement to stabilize so we shifted that entire kind of material ecology uh, to uh, to using uh, waste stone dust from basalt uh, quarries close by the wood came from alhang from ship breaking yards in alhang uh, and uh, we got um, a fly ash from the factory uh, which was which was waste to create these uh, walls of uh, rammed stone dust as you can see here uh, these are some of the initial kind of mock-ups of that. And uh, that's the kind of detailed roof section. And really the kind of diagram is very simple. It's a, set, it's a, se it's a central beam uh, resting on two piers with uh, this kind of A-frame roof, uh, which allows you views on the outside. The roof is in wood. Uh, and the walls are in stone dust. And that's really a kind of, uh, these are visuals of how the, the wood was uh, recycled and uh, it being employed on site. Um, the entire underside of the roof is uh, clad with um, uh, mud rolls, which are about four inches thick. Uh, this creates a kind of insulation uh, that, is, uh, that makes sure that the temperature inside is at least six to seven degrees lower than it's on the outside. And uh, the Mangalore tiles that went up, uh, the first mock-ups, that's Kiran Bhai from Hunarshala working on the project. Uh, deep set uh, grooves for the walls and then the, the floor that's done out of dung and mud. Um, and these are images of the final project. Not a single tree was cut. We were able to kind of save every single tree on site. And uh, all the, the roofs uh, were built out of this uh, insulated mud roll. And you can see the courtyard um, 
and the, the central beam is also a gutter that takes the water away uh, for harvesting on the other side. So that's the, temp that's the project when it opened. And this is where we started off from, right? This is uh, a visual which, while you're inside the project, you're also able to kind of see the, the greenery outside. So that connection between the inside and the outside is not just limited to your physical ability to move between spaces, but also the visual that you're able to connect to uh, at all times. It's a very active community space, as you can see. These are, uh, and these are little gestures that that strict diagram needed to make to allow for the trees to survive. And uh, I think that's something that's also very important. It's not just about how uh, particular your, uh, your, your project idea is, it's also how flexible it might be to, be, to allow for change on site. Uh, this next point uh, is something that uh, that's something that we all I mean it concerns everyone of course that while there are there is a price that we pay for uh, whatever we need uh, to buy material goods or otherwise uh, but what we really have to kind of understand is what are the value of that and this leads me to our research project which is called decoding Mumbai and uh, the idea that uh, Mumbai, basically, or any other city, is typically seen through these lenses of formal formality, which is uh, you know building code and and development plans uh, and the fabric that it produces, or the informal, which is typically kind of looked at as the space in between the formal planning mechanisms, right? Um, so what we, while this is of course very beautifully articulated by a lot of people, whether it's uh, Senate again with the open city, Rahul and the ephemeral city, or even Maximum City with Suketu's kind of wonderful book, but you see these these kind of manifestations of this this idea idea that there is a kind of deep structure that already exists that allows for, let's say, the Dabawalas to operate with a six sigma rating when they deliver tiffins from homes to offices, or for the fact that there is an emergent cluster theory that seems to happen for all kinds of various programs in the uh, Bhuleshwar Kalbadevi area. Um, and to understand what this deep structure is, uh, one of the, our key interests was housing, and we were really trying to look at how we can actually uh, decode what this destructure might, uh, deep structure might be. And it's through this kind of question of housing that we, uh, we, uh, uh, we kind of started looking at uh, this idea of Mumbai and any other city that wants to be Mumbai. And the fact that there is a massive push to build housing, right? And this is uh, an old graphic which says two crore houses to be constructed by 2022, uh, which, wasn't, which hasn't happened. But of course, there was an entire physical, there was an entire financial infrastructure that was built to enable that to happen. And yet what gets built on ground is this, right? So this is what gets built in the name of housing. Uh, and that really led us to kind of start looking at various kinds of projects that uh, already existed in the city where affordable housing was present, uh, both historically and currently, and to then examine them without any kind of emotive quality, just purely in terms of metrics, in terms of social space, in terms of circulation, and just compare these across board. Uh, what we were trying to do is move away from the idea of narrative, even though narrative is important, but to really look at if there is a way that there is some uh, systemic learning that can be made available to look at, uh, to look at these agencies that who might want to design affordable housing. What comes across is very clear that there are these uh, five criteria that need to, to, to work. I mean, the first is networks. Uh, the example of this wonderful project called the Swadeshi Market, which I, uh, I suggest everybody visit in Mumbai, it's actually three-fourths the size of a Manhattan city block. It has, uh, it's a mixed-use project, like other projects in the city, but the, uh, the, the key difference here is that if I want to go from one part of the city to the next, there are double-height streets that run through the underbelly of this project that allow you to walk through, so it's a shortcut. So it's a private realm that becomes completely public at ground, and then above you have uh, chawls for housing uh, people. These are those double-height streets. Uh, there's a complex kind of ventilation mechanism that allows for uh, a ventilation to happen in those streets, and these are the, this is above the podium where um, where you have housing. This is built in, eight, uh, in 1910 uh, and it uh, still stands today. Uh, the other format, of course, this is an image that most of us from Mumbai would know. It's a chawl with, with kind of corridors on all sides, with units on either side. And the fact that it creates a kind of intimate uh, relationship between uh, residents where the outdoor space becomes almost like this kind of common living room. Uh, it's been, as you know already, it might, uh, it's been the kind of uh, center for many, uh, uh, many uh, movements to come out of it, whether it's the Ganpati Festival, whether it's the Freedom Festival, as, uh, the Freedom uh, Struggle as well, Tilak kind of mobilizing people from the Charles. But this is really uh, one of the reasons why that kind of close community uh, exists because of this ratio of X by 2X. Um, and also the fact that there is a need for expansion. So, uh, and how does that happen when you actually ha look at some of these projects which are completely covered and grime and you tend to kind of look through them, but they are extremely sophisticated mechanisms to expand housing 
houses that already were one room tenements without common toilet with with uh, with no uh, 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 attached toilets and kitchens uh, where people have now made interventions very very articulated structural interventions that we've drawn in our research where you, these two little blocks that, uh, that kind of poke out of that building are actually a kitchen and a bathroom uh, that's been added to single room tenements that used to be worker housing. So it's already hybridized. And as much as this, these, this idea of housing is about the kind of meta picture, it's also about the smallest of details where a small, where a very thin corridor that leads from the entrance of the house to the room beyond actually has this collapsible ladder that was that is designed and has been there in many, many projects for about uh, 100 years. Uh, which kind of opens up and closes to allow for people to move through or to access the mezzanine room that they've built later. And you've got to ask yourself, right, that when you, when you have such kind of embedded intelligence in historic fabric, why do we still build like this, where, where, where one in every 10 people living in some of these state-built housing uh, suffers from respiratory diseases? And uh, the question that you, that you ask, you obviously want to think that it's, 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 not, it's not built to code, right? But actually it is. I mean, this is, this is code stipulated that you can build buildings that are almost 20 stories high, uh, just 10 feet, 10 feet apart. And um, this warehouse for people is, is really we were, uh, is what we were questioning. What is the kind of building code that allows you to do that? And we went back into the history of Mumbai to look at the, uh, the origin of the first building codes, which came about when the plague started, uh, where uh, the BIT, the Bombay Improvement Trust, starts demolishing existing fabric and building new housing uh, through town planning mechanisms. Uh, this is Princess Street, which was a, a fabric that was demolished because it was too congested. And uh, the fact that as, you, as time progresses and 1964 is when the first development plan comes about, social housing becomes a big uh, kind of thing. FSI is introduced, slum clearance becomes important. So these various criteria uh, kind of start up a new kind of building code that, that is then kind of uh, extrapolated into various social mechanisms that also kind of tie back into uh, the, social, the socialist orientation of the state at that point. Uh, one of the big things was FSI first kind of introduced, which basically meant when people were actually saying that there are lots of migrants coming to Bombay residents petitioned the municipality to say that let us add one more floor to our ground plus two building so that we can accommodate more people, which meant that they were actually increasing the area from being uh, one FSI that was consumed. So one is to one is what you actually get in your plot. By adding one more floor, you got 1.33. Now, what was supposed to be a makeshift arrangement to add floors to a building became the de facto FSI for the entire city for any kind of construction. So again, the, the lack of, of thinking about how bylaws was, were written is, is something that persists even to the day, to a point where FSI now is something that drives real estate development. All development now is private. The state uh, is divesting all its kind of responsibilities uh, for social welfare through the private sector. And if you look at uh, uh, building code now, it's no longer about light and ventilation as it first was. It's now primarily about maximizing real estate to a point where you get extreme conditions such as these where uh, there's a kind of dystopic uh, city that's being created, one which with a podium for sale where residents live above that entire alternate ground plane and one where the slum dwellers who have been rehabilitated stay in this kind of hole in the ground almost. Um, or then even these kind of almost uh, maniacal kind of uh, gestures where 10 floors of parking in a building uh, actually uh, hold just five floors of residential apartments above. And it's, uh, it's primarily to kind of increase the height of the building so that they get better views and they can charge more uh, as developers for, uh, for those apartments that are being sold upstairs. Um, to a last uh, stage where we was uh, then kind of questioning what is the future of, of the city of Mumbai through building code and the fact that Mumbai is no longer about uh, development, it's primarily about redevelopment. All of the fabric will be renewed and what is the nature of that renewal? One question that you know is constantly asked about Mumbai or constantly kind of mentioned is that there isn't, we don't, we don't have enough FSI, right? So F4 is the maximum FSI that's, uh, that's officially there on books but if you actually compute the numbers, you get buildings that have built almost 13 to 14 times the amount of FSI that they had, largely due to exemptions that you can you can basically pay a premium to violate uh, you know kind of uh, capacities. Um, and the fact that if you look at the history of the city, it's gone from being about a larger scale. Uh, the development has gone about from being about you know larger neighborhoods down to a plot. And the tragedy here lies in the fact that 
while development is now becoming about a plot and uh, the development plan per se looks about uh, over the entire city's land use, the area in between the plot and the city is not factored in. So urban design as such as a discipline does not exist and there are no guidelines to kind of address that. Uh, and the fact that this is only going to get worse with the kind of densities that we are building with, coming to the idea that this kind of uh, extreme condition will also change the nature of our interface with the city. Because we will, we will live in our towers where we will get into our cars, drive on these coastal roads and get to our, our offices. So one, from one uh, real estate uh, archipelago to another one, uh, missing the space in between completely. So the question is also where is our city? Is it the, the real estate archipelago or is it the space in between? Uh, I'm going to now uh, maybe kind of choose uh, to kind of talk about this one quote uh, which was uh, here. Uh, this is something that uh, I saw Ayush talk about this a little bit earlier, uh, you know, would you, would you do it just because you can? And um, many years ago as a student, I actually had the pleasure of working with a faculty member designing light fixtures with, uh, with scrap metal. And we had uh, Astad Debu come and uh, dance at the inauguration of that, uh, of that exhibition. Uh, he was fantastic. He did this beautiful subtle movement across these various levels and uh, it, it, was, it was poetry in motion, right? But at the end, he suddenly stopped at one far end of the room and then ran across and somersaulted, right? And it was really a kind of dramatic end to that entire uh, move and I was, we were all wondering as to what happened. So he kind of looked back at us, knew we were surprised and said that, you know, it's not, and this is the time that Akshay Kumar had just burst onto the scene, right? With all the kind of gyrations and all of that. So he said, it's not like I can't do all of the stuff that Akshay Kumar does. I choose not to do it is and that's what's important I think it's the idea that you make a choice to be able to exercise and to be able to truly understand what the value uh, would be to any any move that you make architecturally spatially or formally and this is a project one of our earlier ones that we've actually done in Manali where we worked with local waste material to create these projects that use uh, sl uh, slate stone chip use a uh, Katkuni construction technique to kind of weather against earthquakes balconies that are oriented towards a view and lastly, uh, the, the last project is about authorship, right? And this is something that I'm very interested in, primarily from the fact that I just can't believe that as architects, we believe we are authors because there are just so many agencies that are involved in a project, project's realization that I have no uh, mandate to kind of call myself an author. One of the projects that we kind of, uh, that exempl exemplifies this for me is one of the first ones that we did, the Shift Temple in, in Vadeshwar, uh, building on the idea of uh, traditional temple architecture. Uh, we worked with local villagers uh, and that the priests to actually create a temple built out of local basalt using traditional planning principles, orientation based on how you walk around the trees and two stone walls that direct you on the uh, uh, east-west axis, and the fact that that temple was built by the local villagers uh, uh, through shramdan, that's donation of labor, in between their uh, their planting schedules, uh, and it's built out of a local basalt stone five minutes away from the quarry, uh, from the site, uh, and uh, the, uh, the sense of ownership that the people have on the temple is, is far greater than possibly what I have since they were actually the ones building it and our role was really uh, one of facilitation rather than uh, um, than actually kind of designing and building it. So uh, these are just some images of that. This, this last bit is really about uh, what my, when I started kind of uh, deciding to be an architect, these were the choices that I was working with and uh, to archaeology, uh, cinematography and architecture and in some sense with our practice we've been, I, I think we've been doing all three of these and uh, the greatest influence I think for me was growing up was my, this, this, my grandfather used to deal with traditional Kashmiri artifacts and looking at him kind of uh, working on these little, these, these, these little artifacts in whether it's paper mache or metal uh, was something that was very kind of uh, ingrained in me while I kind of was growing up as well and that in some sense is for me uh, uh, the a consequence of kind of practicing these questions that we've kind of I've just presented to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.